Good morning, and welcome to South Union Christian Church. We are so excited that you are here to worship with us this morning. Before we begin, we have a few announcements. It's that time of year again. We're looking for some volunteers to sign up to help mow the church yard. If that seems like something you'd be interested in, make sure you sign up at the sign-up sheet on the bulletin board or contact Jimmy for more details. Our playground is getting new mulch as we prepare for all the fun children's events that we're gonna have this summer. The mulch will be ready to spread May 10th through the 16th. If you are able to help any of those days, make sure you sign up for the days that you are available and contact Jackie Goss for more information on how you can help. You will need to bring a rake, shovel, gloves, and a wheelbarrow. VBS registration is now open. VBS Treasured is June 7th through the 11th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Your kids don't want to miss out on this week of fun. To register, make sure you go to southunioncc.com slash children or go out to the registration table in the foyer and sign up there. We also need a lot of volunteers left for VBS, so if you want to be involved in that way, make sure you go online and sign up there or talk to Jackie Goss. Join us for our church-wide prayer event as we gather to celebrate for the National Day of Prayer this Thursday, May 6th. We're going to gather here at the church at 6.30 p.m. and we are going to travel to three different locations to pray for different institutions in our community and nation. Invite your family and your friends. As we get closer to graduation, we want to make sure that we're honoring our graduating seniors. If you know of a graduating senior or have a graduating senior, make sure you get into contact with me so that we can make sure we honor them in the best way possible. If you're a first time guest with us here this morning, we are so excited that you're here. Make sure you head out to the Welcome Center to fill out a connection card and pick up a gift bag. And as always, if you're in any need of prayer or support, make sure you reach out to a staff member or the church office so that we can help out in any way that we can. Well, that's all the announcements we have for you today. It's going to be a remarkable morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. We're so excited to see you here. Just a quick clarification on some of those announcements. They mentioned a bulletin board, but we forgot to mention where the bulletin board is. It's just the one right over here um, outside the restrooms, in case you don't know, in case you want to get signed up to help with any of those outdoor chores that are needed to be done. I'm going to go ahead and pray, so stand up with me, and then we'll get started with some worship. Lord, we just lay everything at your feet this morning. We are so in awe of you, as always. We're so blessed that we get to be here and worship you together. I pray that we would just be solely focused on you, Lord, that we would hear something new that we need to hear this morning, and that we would take it to heart. It's in all these things that I pray. Amen. We wait, we wait. 
You're coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. And I we wait, you're coming soon. Like a bride waiting for the groom, there'll be church. Ready for you, every heart longing for our King. We sing like the bride waiting for the groom. We'll be church ready for you, every heart longing for our King. We sing even so come, Lord Jesus. So come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so come, Lord Jesus,
family, did you know Jesus was coming back? Is that pretty good news? Talk to him about it just for a minute. all the promises you've made to us by the way I've never caught you in any lies it's got to rank among the top coming back today would be a good day Lord I know when we say that we start thinking about things we haven't done think about people that aren't here yet people that but you, you're so perfect you work all that out nothing here we're going to miss this would be a good moment but until you come to get us going to rest in that knowledge and that peace and that joy and that hope and give you all the praise. It's in your precious name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Hey, I don't want you to just flip through that Thursday night announcement for the prayer van. That was the little girl's title for that. We're, we're going to act like the house of prayer that we are, and we're going to go. We're going to three places. We're going to pray for this community and for the nation and for our churches. So, that's Thursday night at 6.30. Man, we'd love to have you come. It's going to be a special time. We, we just uh, spent, finished the week camping down at Boggs. Angie and I, the kids came down a couple of nights. With 69 in place, it's easy to come back and forth to work. It only takes about 35 minutes to get here. Wednesday's kind of bad because, you know, it's 6 o'clock in the morning, and then we had church Wednesday night. But it was good. It was really good. We love to camp. <clears throat> in fact, we love to vacation. And I think I've told you this story before, which is a preacher's way of saying you're about to hear it again. But about four or five years ago, somebody came to me, and, and I, I was reminded of it because somebody asked me this just last week. Anyway, this brother came to me here, and he, his name shall remain nameless. And he said, hey, how in the world do you canes take three vacations every year? And I said, well, you know, it's pretty simple. We, we go camping in the spring, and my mother-in-law pays for the campsite, and we take her RV. And then we go camping in the fall. And my mother-in-law pays for the campsite, and we drive her RV. And then we try to do something in the summertime, and my mother-in-law pays for half the condo unless we can get Ken Goldman to give us a freebie. So you see in the common denominator. But this guy wouldn't let up. He said three times a year. I said, brother, you haven't been out to my house? He said, no. And I said, well, 25 years ago, Angie and I decided to buy a modular home. We bought a $40,000 modular home. Now, I'm not dogging my house. I love my house, but it's a $40,000 modular home. Now, thanks to the Cardwells and, and Leon of fixing it up a couple years ago, it looks brand new, but it's still a $40,000 modular home. I said, by the way, brother, what did you pay for your house? He said, $170,000. I said, never mind how I can afford three vacations. How does anybody pay $170,000 for a house? You know? So we laughed, and he got my point. But, you know, life is about choices. It is. I mean, the Canes have chosen to live in a cheap home and go on vacation, and that's not for everybody. It's been good for us. You, you've chosen some things that they'd never do, and you've chosen some things that they'd never do. We all make different choices, which is good. We have freedom to do that. But there's one choice that all of us should make, and if you're here today and you're not a Christian, this is your choice. It's Acts 2, 238. Peter preached an amazing sermon on the day of Pentecost, and when it was over, people believed the truth, and they said, what must we do to be saved? That's a pretty clear question, isn't it? And Peter's answer was even more clear. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To have the Holy Spirit and to know Jesus is coming back to get us, to be free from sin, is an amazing place to be. Can I get an amen to that? Absolutely. 1 John 3, 3 says, those of us that have that hope in us purify ourselves because he is pure. Which means, now that you and I have this hope of being Christians, we ought to be living holy lives. Now, most of us in here have been in church long enough to know that holy just means different. We ought to stand out today, especially with the media and, and all the groups that are out there. We ought to be different people, attractively different that's, that's important, but we ought to be different. We ought to think differently. We ought to feel differently. We ought to respond differently than the rest of the world. We, we should have different moral standards, different language, different priorities. Our, our attitudes on racial issues and, and political issues and all the gender stuff and all the moral stuff ought to stand out. It ought to be different than everything around us. We serve a holy God, and we should be holy people. 
And deep down in our hearts, we all know that. But the problem is living it. Am I right? It is. It's, it's called sin. Most of you know what Sin City is, Las Vegas, Nevada. Do you know what Den City is? It's mass over volume. I just want to see if you're still awake, okay? Uh, all of us in here this morning pretty much basically know what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. Sometimes, especially in the days we're living in, we just need some motivation to get it done. Uh, first Peter chapter 1 this morning, he's going to give us some motivation. He spends the first, you pull out a blue Bible if you want, First Peter chapter 1, keep it if you need it, pull up your phone. He spends the first 12 verses in that chapter reminding us of the hope we have in Jesus Christ and then you get to verse 13 and he says therefore all of you have studied with me long enough to know that when it says therefore in the bible we got to ask what's it there for and in this case peter says you've got this awesome hope in you as a christian and we just talked about the joy that we have hebrews 12 2 last week and peter says based on the fact you've got this amazing hope and this incredible joy you ought to be living holy lives and then he gives us several incentives on how to get this done. And interestingly enough, we just sang about the first one because the first one is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, we just talked about focus last week. Boy, that'll give you focus, you know. Verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. When Jesus Christ is revealed... I mean, the greatest hope you and I have and the greatest joy we have as Christians is the promise of Jesus he's coming back to get us. He promised that. I've never caught him in a lie. John 14, 1, he said, I'm going right now to prepare a place for you. When I get it prepared, I'm coming back to get you. He, he said, uh, the angel told the men at Galilee in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, why are you stand there looking in the sky? The same Jesus that ascended is coming back the same way he left. In other words, why are you stand there with your mouth gaping open? He's coming back. Everything's going to be okay. By the way, in the meantime, why don't you live like that? Paul sold, told the church at Thessalonica in chapter 4, verse 16, The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. And John ended the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse, by, verse 20, by saying, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Peter said he's coming back. Set your minds in action to that. We would say concentrate. Think about that as you go through your life tomorrow. Christ could come back any minute. You know, if you, if you knew in advance your house was going to burn down in a month, I doubt very seriously if you'd shampoo the carpet and paint the walls and buy new furniture. No, if you knew for, in advance your house was going to burn down, you'd spend next week getting all your valuables out of it. Well, guess what? We know in advance that Christ is coming back to get us. We also know the world we're living in is going to burn up with fire. So why should we spend all our time gathering up all this stuff? We ought to be gathering our stuff to take with us. Live the kind of life that God expects. Be holy. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. And then he says, be self-controlled. Don't let your appetites and your desires and peer pressure and greed dictate how you behave. You live like holy people. Even though it's crazy different than the world around you, you live that way today. Bob Russell was talking to a bunch of young men. That's where he got all of these notes. And, and he was talking to a bunch of young men, and he said, how's your self-control, fellas? And they said, what do you mean? He said, well, let's say that you're uh, at home on uh, Friday night and it's just you and your girlfriend, nobody else is there, and you got the lights down, you're in the living room, you're snuggling. How's your self-control? He said, that's pretty tough, Bob. He said, well, let's say you hear a car door slam outside and your girlfriend says, oh my goodness, that's my mom and dad, they're home early. Now how's your self-control? And it changes a little bit. That's what Peter's saying. Are you having a hard time with self-control, Christian? Having a hard time living the way you know? Start listening for the trumpet call. Start listening for the shout. Focus into that, because it's coming soon, and that'll help you do what you need to do. Those of us who have this hope in ourselves, purify ourselves, John says. We went out to Vegas a couple months ago and spent a couple nights there en route to some of the most beautiful things we've ever seen, but I'm going to tell you, I don't know how long it's been since you've been to Vegas. I don't know if you've been there or not. Don't go back. I'm not going back. I mean, it was ugly before. I've never seen ugly like this. And the first night we were there, I was still on Indiana time. And so I got up at 6.30 in the morning, which is 4.30 out there. And I went down to the casino to get a cup of coffee. And I'm telling you, I, I can't describe to you what I saw. I wouldn't if I could. It was the most unbelievable mess I have ever seen. And I remember thinking, I hope the Lord doesn't come back. He might not find me in this mess. You know what I mean? It was ugly stuff. I, and I seriously went upstairs and wept for those people. I prayed for an hour for what I saw there. 
Peter says, set your mind. Be self-controlled. Jesus is coming back. Ask yourself, I don't want Jesus to come back and find me looking at that on the internet. I don't want him to come back and catch me doing that with my cell phone. I don't want him to come back and catch me seeing this or doing that. Jesus is coming back. That's a pretty good incentive to live a holy life. Focus on that. The second incentive for holiness is the example of the Father. Look at verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but as he called you as holy, you be holy in all you do. You know, it's just human nature for us to become like our parents as we grow up. It's just instinct. Uh, most of you know, for, for years, my pattern has been, well, since I've been preaching, on Saturday night, I preach my sermon four times, and Sunday morning, I preach it two more. And I always ask the Holy Spirit to change anything, and I don't want it to be me, but I, I preach out of a manuscript, and I don't want to just read it to you on Sunday morning. So I've always, that's always been my practice. Well, years ago, Ashley was just a little bitty booger, and she was sitting down on the floor scribbling something on a piece of paper, and then she got up and went in her bedroom and slammed the door and started shouting. And when she came out, Angie said, honey, what have you been doing in there? I've been going over my sermon. <laughs> I said, did they laugh at your jokes? Because that's the important thing. See, kids just want to imitate their parents. They just do. And we've got to be honest about that. Husbands, haven't you heard your mother-in-law and your wife before? Don't answer that out loud. You'll have a bad afternoon. Wives, haven't you heard your father? I mean, you're, you know, haven't you heard yourself say something? Say, oh, my goodness, that sounds just like my dad. Roy Lawson was walking downtown, and he saw a reflection of himself in a department store window. And just for a minute, he thought, well, that looks just like my dad. Wait a minute, that's me. <laughs> As we grow up, we instinctively become like our parents. Well, guess what Peter says? When you became a Christian, you got a brand new nature. You took on the nature of the Heavenly Father. And it just makes sense that as you and I grow up spiritually, we should become more and more like him. A third incentive we have is simply we were commanded to. I mean, that ought to be enough right there. You know, he, he says, be holy. That's an imperative in the Greek. In fact, verse 16, he's quoting Leviticus. Be holy, for he who called you is holy. Sometimes you just do the right thing because you were told to, period. I mean, we've used that on our kids. We've used it on our grandkids. You don't want to explain the whole thing to them. You're in a hurry. You say, just do this. Why? Because I said so. And sometimes we do what we're told just because God said so. End of story. Even though we might not see the full picture might not see the whole thing. He does. That's sure our example from Jesus. And when he started his ministry, he, he started with a 40-day fast, remember, in the mountains? And the enemy came to him and tempted him. He said, why don't you just turn that stone into bread? You've got to be hungry. And Jesus said, it's written. Man doesn't live by bread alone. But every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So then he took him up on the temple. And he said, why don't you just jump off? I mean, you want to start your ministry. You'll wow these people. You'll fill the church up. The Bible says that the angels won't let your foot strike against a stone. And Jesus said, no, no, no. It's written, you shouldn't test the Lord your God. So then he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, the Bible says. He said, I'll give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. And he said, you get away from me. It's also written, you worship the Lord God and serve him only. Isn't it interesting? He always quoted scripture in the face of a temptation. Why did he do that? Is there magic in the scripture that scares Satan off? Well, I wish I'd do it if it was. The, the truth is, Satan knows the Bible better than any other, anybody that's in here, which is spooky in itself. The reason Jesus quoted Scripture all the time is because he made a commitment to know God's Word and to be obedient to it no matter what. Whether he understood it or not, he had made a commitment, and that should be us. Years ago, when uh, Earl Weaver was still the manager of the Baltimore Orioles, uh, Orioles that goes way back for some of you, uh, Ken, I know you're old enough to remember this, but anyway, it's been a long time ago. Reggie Jackson's on first base, and he's looking in the dugout to get a, a steal sign from her, but he didn't give him one. But Reggie knew he could steal second, so he went anyway. And he slid under the tag, and the umpire said, safe! And he got up, brushed himself off, and looked in the dugout with a smurf. Well, after the game, Earl Weaver called him over, and he said, Reggie, I knew you could steal second base. I know the catcher, and I know your speed. What you didn't think about was Lee May is the only left-handed batter I have against a right-hander, and he's been on fire. And when you stole second, that opened up first base, and they intentionally walked him. I had to use a left-handed pitch hitter. He struck out. I didn't have any more pitch hitters for the rest of the game. We lost. See, Reggie wanted to steal second. Earl Weaver wanted to win the game. We, we want to do our certain things. God wants us to win. 
So we just obey. When the Bible says stay above the appearance of evil, you do it. When the Bible says you don't lie, even to get out of something, you do it. When the Bible says you don't gossip. When the Bible says flee sexual fornication, get away from sexual morality, you do it. Even though you don't understand it, even though it sounds like a sacrifice to you, you understand that God loves you and he wants you to win. He said it. He commanded it. We do it. The fourth incentive of the judgment of God, verse 17. Since we call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your life as strangers here in reverent fear. Fear. You know, I read just last week that a swordfish is one of the only fish in the ocean that has no natural predators. So they're not afraid of anything. (laughs) Except the pinfish, which is said to be mightier than... I I asked a few of you last week what you're afraid of, and I got some of the strangest answers. One of you said you're afraid of speed bumps. And I said, speed bumps? And you said, yeah, but I'm slowly getting over it. (laughs) One one of you said, one of you said you're afraid of elevators, but you're taking steps to avoid it. One of you said you're afraid of fences. You just can't seem to get over it. One of you said you're afraid of moving stairs. In fact, it seems to be getting worse. You might say it's escalating. Oh, it gets worse. I got one more. This is a bad one. One of you said you had an irrational fear of complicated industrial facilities. So you have a complex, complex, complex. (laughs) Fear. It's not the highest motivator, but I tell you, it's a start. And when we think about the fact that one day God's going to sit as judge over us. I make us some pause, you know what I mean? I, I know how the world sees God today. The world sees God as some doting grandfather that just gives you anything you ask for. You, you haven't talked to him in two months, you need some money, you, you, you call and ask him, <laughs> he just passes it out, you know? He just is tolerant of anything, any movement, any new fad, God's okay with it, come on, he loves, he's generous, he's merciful, he is all those things, but I want to tell you something else about our God, he's just and he is capable of unbelievable wrath. It's going to be spooky someday for a lot of people. You ever been to court? It's intimidating. It's supposed to be. You got a judge. He's got a gown. And you got a cop there with a gun. And, you know, he's got a gavel. And you got to put your hand on a Bible and swear. I was about 16 years old. Timmy Roberts and I went. Uh, just over the railroad tracks out of, out of the city limits in Plainfield to site in our 22s for squirrel season. We did it every year. And uh, we had no idea that the guy that owned the junkyard just down the road a little bit had called the police and said somebody was shooting at him. So when the cops showed up, two cop cars with the lights on and the sirens started giving us a hard time. Well, we knew we were okay. We are just shooting our 22s. We were outside the city limits, so we were kind of cocky. 16-year-old kids cocky with the policeman. That's what you're supposed to do, right? until they put us in the car and radioed into the, into the office and said, we have the two shooting suspects. I was a shooting suspect. I was mortified and horrified. But that was nothing compared to a month later when I had to go to court with my dad to get my gun back that had been confiscated. You talk about a rock and a hard place. You got a judge on one side and an irate dad on the other. Did you ever stop to think about one day we're going to be before the judgment seat of the creator of the universe? Kind of spooky. And and look how Peter says he judges. Impartial or partial? He judges impartially. How about you? Do you want a partial judge or an impartial judge? Well, it depends on whether you're guilty. If I'm guilty, I want a partial judge. If I get caught for speeding out here on 69, I'm going 12 miles an hour with the speed limit. I want a partial policeman to say, oh, wait a minute. You're you're that guy out there at South Union Christian Church. My grandma goes to your church. She loves you. She said you got the funniest jokes. Oh, I see you're an IU fan. I love Tom Allen. Look, you weren't going that fast. Go on, man. Get out of here. I want a partial judge. The Bible says we're going to get an impartial one. You imagine standing in line at Judgment Day, and you got Billy Graham in front of you, and in front of him is Mother Teresa. You're thinking, I'm cooked. No, no, no. Impartial. Now, there's some real good news for us here. But if you're in the building today or you're listening to me today and you've still not pulled the trigger, what in the world's wrong with you? And you've still not pulled the trigger on accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to remind you that there's two judgments. And the first judgment is for those people outside of Jesus Christ, and it will be brutal. We promised you a couple weeks ago we will not candy coat this anymore. 
standing before God without Jesus Christ is going to be amazingly nasty. You're going to have to give an account for every word you've spoken. Everything that's been hidden is going to be laid wide open for everybody to see. Nasty. The good news for us Christians ain't going to be that way for us. We're not going to stand before God with any sin issues at all because we settle out of court with that one. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin, and we've been totally forgiven because of that, which is amazing stuff. So what are we going to be judged for? Well, Paul says we're going to be judged for the way we live so we can get rewards. Isn't that cool? Listen to how he says it. 1 Corinthians 3.11. Paul says, For no one can lay any other foundation than that of Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation, so again, he's talking about a Christian. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Notice the two kinds of building materials. Costly stones, you got gold and silver. They're not easily burned up. Then you got wood, hay, and straw. They go up just like that. The day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, Paul says. The fire will test the quality of each man's work. The fire will test the quality of each man's life. If what he's built survives, he'll receive a reward. If it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. How do you want to spend eternity? Christian, you want to just barely scooch in? Or do you want to stand against the stream and live a holy life and have the Father look at you one day and say, well done. Oh my goodness, you did good. I mean, you did good with this, you did good with it, you didn't do so good with this. But you know what? You did well over here. Come, I've got an amazing reward for you. <laughs> one more incentive. This is a big one. The cost of redemption, verse 18. For you know, know that it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Now, we pretty much understand what's going on there, but I'm telling you, if you were listening to Peter preach that day, you knew exactly what he was saying, because during the Roman Empire, there were 50 million slaves. That's a lot of slaves. And there was only two ways out of being a slave, unless you died, or you got out that way. You could buy your own freedom. So if they put you on the auction block and you sold for $500, if you could somehow come up with $502, you could buy your freedom, but no slave had that kind of money. The other one was just as uncommon and just as un un unlikely, and that is if you could find somebody to buy your freedom for you. <laughs> Here we go again. Always comes to this, doesn't it? It's always will the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. You and I are slaves. We were slaves to sin, depravity, and greed, and lust. I mean, the heart is despicable and deadly, viciously evil, the Bible says. Who can know it? We just were trapped in slaves. But Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Shouldn't we live different lives for that? I think so. So, most of you know I'm a huge Western fan. Watched Open Range last night for the 50th time. I just love Western. And one of my favorites is John Wayne's The Shootist. That's the last movie he made. And the premise of the movie is he's got terminal cancer. And Jimmy Stewart, who's amazing anyway, is telling him what, what will happen. And John Wayne says, hey, I want to know how this is going to end up. He said, I'd rather not tell you. He said, please, I want to know. And so he describes it to him. He said, well, you're going to wake up one morning in bed, and you're going to say, this is where I'm going to stay. And he said, the pain is going to be so bad, so excruciating. There's no drug that's going to touch it. And, and you will scream in agony. And if you're lucky, you'll pass out. And John Wayne's just kind of shaking. He said, man, I'm sorry. I didn't want to tell you. He said, no, I ask. He's walking him to the door. And Jimmy Stewart said, one, one more thing I might add. This is not a suggestion, so it's something to think about while your mind is still clear. He said, what's that? And he said, you're a brave man. There's no doubt about that. If I had your courage, there's no way I'd die a death I just described. And of course, John Wayne went out in the shootout. You know, it's a good movie. 
I really hate talking to you if you're here today and you're not a Christian about what's coming. I hate it. I, I feel like I, I have to. I really don't want to, but I, I have to. Have you read about hell in the scripture? Ne- never mind the fire and brimstone and the worm that never dies. Never mind the pain and agony. F- forget all this stuff. It is death. The wages of sin is death. And we all know that death is separation from God for eternity. No good at all. No light at all for eternity. If I had the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which I know you do, there's no way I'd die a death that I just described to you. You come up to the altar this morning, spend some time, thank Jesus for what he did for you to save you from that, and, and talk to him about being holy living Christian and if you haven't accepted him don't leave here without it if you're at home watching call me today we're running low on time
This week, God put a song in my heart that we've sung many times before, but it had been a while since I had actually sat and really reflected and meditated on what these lyrics talk about, They're very powerful lyrics. Um, and the song is based on several scriptures, but I wanted to share one of those with you this morning. It goes right along with what Jimmy ended talking his sermon about. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins and his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And I just wanted to um, put emphasis on that point again for whoever needs to hear this this morning, that you can get freedom from any sin you are struggling with today through the power of the cross, through the gift that Jesus gave us. And I know sometimes that's easier said than done in our hearts Sometimes we feel like, oh, I can never forgive myself for this thing that I've done. I could never forgive someone else for something they've done to me. And because of that, how could God possibly ever forgive me? But those are all lies. And if we believe those lies for a second, then what is the power of the cross for? So I just want to encourage you to remember those words from 1 Peter 2.24 as we sing this song together. Remember that by his wounds you are healed completely. Um, and that we can live for righteousness. If you are unsure of what that means, if you haven't made a decision for Christ before in your life, I want you to come down and talk to Jimmy during these songs. You don't have to wait. You can come talk to me after the service, find any staff member um, or a trusted Christian friend, 
and talk to them about that today. Let's worship together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new now begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains i'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt, he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You were made me. Your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had gone. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. We're free. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yeah, we're free, free, forever in Arrested, my life began. Oh, we're free, free, forever we are free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yeah, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested, my life began. When death was arrested, my life began. When death was arrested, my life began. It's your breath in our lungs, 
So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give life. You are love. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you love. all the earth will shout his praise and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing so much for being here this morning. It's been awesome worshiping with you. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's 